Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We will get started in just about two minutes. All right, welcome everybody. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Um, we're really excited to have you here for our last installment for 2020 of Northern Now, which is a digital event series um, by the alumni, NMU Alumni Association for all alumni and friends. My name is Kylie Bunting. I'm the digital engagement architect for alumni relations here at NMU. And I'm really glad that you have joined us for tonight's presentation. Um, uh, I'm really excited for what's in store. It's going to be a great evening and you're going to be starving at the end of it, trust me. Um, so we're excited to continue this series with Chef Alden Griffiths, who is a 2010 NMU grad and also NMU catering manager, Derek Estes, a 2019 NMU grad. But first, I just want to touch on a couple of logistics. Um, we cannot see or hear you in this webinar format, but we still want to hear from you. So please use the Q&A function to ask any questions for our chefs. Um, myself and moderator Diane Stone will be uh, monitoring the Q&A function closely and sharing your questions as they come in. So please share any questions that you have um, during the demonstration right there. Also, you can use the chat function uh, to talk to other alumni and friends watching. So tell us where you're from, tell us when you, um, when you graduated, a favorite enemy memory, or perhaps what you're excited to make uh, for the holidays in the kitchen as well. Um, a quick note on the chat function, it is defaulted to all panelists. If you look at the drop down menu, make sure you change that to all panelists and attendees so, um, so everybody can see what you're saying and chat with you. Just a quick, uh, a quick note on some upcoming events. So save the date, we are continuing Northern now as we enter 2021. So it takes place the second Wednesday of the month. Um, and we're excited. We have some great things planned for you for the beginning of the year. Uh, on January 13th, we are um, going to be featuring some computer science NMU faculty and alumni. And we're gonna be talking about artificial intelligence. So a little shift from holiday cooking, but still um, it's gonna be a really great topic. and. Um, really great conversation. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Registration is now live. So please visit nmu.edu slash alumni slash events. If you are um, interested in signing up, I'll also share um, the link to the registration in the chat in just a few moments. And then just keep in touch with us. Follow us on social media. We, um, 
we're trying to do some really great things and stay connected with all of our alumni and friends. So make sure you, uh, you keep in touch on there and we wanna hear from you. So um, we look forward to connecting and we're so glad that you're here to join us. And uh, now I am excited to turn it over to um, Diane Stone, who is also a fellow NMU grad, a 2010 grad. And she also is the current NMU events manager. So welcome, Diane. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, hang on, Diane, you're muted. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank That's you right. for having me. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm thrilled tonight to introduce um, our chefs who are um, excited to show you some elevated holiday leftover recipes. First, I'd like to welcome Chef Alden Griffiths, a 2010 NMU grad and the executive chef of dining services at NMU. Chef Alden joined our team at the beginning of this year after years of experience in industry ranging from ice cream to baking, to high volume line cooking, to teaching, and she loves sharing her knowledge and experience to help folks feel more comfortable in the kitchen. And joining Chef Alden is NMU Catering Manager, Derek Estes. There he is, a 2019 <laughs> graduate of NMU's hospitality program. His skills include years of experience in dietary, baking, line cooking, catering, and restaurant management. He enjoys new foods, cooking techniques, and sharing them with others. Welcome Chef Alden and Chef Derek. Okay, hi everybody. It's so good to see you here. We're excited to have you. This is a lot of fun for both of us. So we're happy to share some of the things that we love to do with our holiday leftovers. I know sometimes you're going to the fridge after about the eighth or 10th time, looking at those leftovers and you look at your plate and you're thinking, do I really wanna eat this? Or do I wanna throw it against the wall? Or, you know, you get like really kind of burnt out. So today we're gonna to demonstrate a really classic dish that is a cornerstone of my childhood. And I think maybe uh, most folks in the Midwest childhood is turkey and noodles. And then Derek's going to lighten the flavors up and do a twist on some of your leftover beef that you might have after a Christmas roast, which is pretty exciting. So I'm just gonna jump right in and talk about turkey and noodles. This is something I grew up seeing my grandma Mac cook after Thanksgiving. And my grandmother was a phenomenal cook. Both my grandmothers were. And she would make these meals that were so elaborate and had all this food. And she'd have these tins of goodies during the holidays that you'd walk around and open up and she'd have Buckeyes and Chex Mix and all these amazing things. And, and then I would remember that one of my favorite parts actually was after Thanksgiving and she would make turkey and noodles. It also freezes great, which is wonderful because if you don't wanna look at turkey for a while, you can make this, throw it together, throw it in your freezer and pull it out on a cold winter's night in like late January when you're like, you know what? A nice bowl of soup would be really good right now. So to get started, we're gonna talk a little bit about the stock that we made. So we took a turkey, roasted it, carved it, and then we made a stock. Now, a lot of people um, I talked to are a little intimidated by stock because they'll tell me their stock's a little too weak or it just doesn't taste like it does when you buy it in the store where first of all, it's never gonna taste like it does when you buy it in the store. And if you do it right, it's gonna taste a whole lot better. And that's because the stock you make at home doesn't have all that added sodium or preservatives, or they'll put like uh, ascorbic acid sometimes in stocks for a preservative. And you have none of those things in your stock, which is a very good thing. So we take our carcass, we throw it in the, we throw it in our pot, you can do it in a crock pot. You can do it in your instant pot. You can even do stock in your oven. Now it's a little scandalous to say that, but if you do it really low and slow, your oven will even eke out all those delicious flavors. And then for everyone who signed up ahead of time, you should have gotten an email with a recipe. And in that recipe, there are other things that go in the stock that we call aromatics. And aromatics are like your vegetables, your carrot, celery, onion, parsley, thyme, and bay leaf. 
bay leaf is really important in stock and I always put an extra bay leaf in mine, just so you know, because <laughs> I love bay leaf. So then we cook that really low with cold water to start. And the reason that's so important is that we want the flavors to be extracted from your vegetables and your bones slowly. And when you bring that cold water up slowly, what it does is it brings more flavor out of your bones before the proteins that are still left on your carcass start to set from the heat. And so cold water is really important. It also makes for a clearer stock, which is really nice when you look at it. It looks fancier because you don't have those cloudy bits in your stock. And you can see here, if at the camera, it, you can see there's no floating bits. It just has a nice, solid kind of brownish color, which is what you want. I make stock out of all my leftover roasted chickens. The roast history chicken from like Meyer, you know, like I'll make stock out of that. The same thing. You do the same recipe just with a chicken carcass instead of a turkey carcass. Then we cool our stock ahead of time. And the reason I like to do that is I like to scrape all the fat off the top because if there's extra flat fat, it'll actually make it kind of, it'll give you a weird mouthfeel in your soup. So there's our stock. <laughs> and if you have any questions about anything I'm doing or any of this food, uh, put your uh, questions in the Q&A section and Diane will shout out while I'm cooking, which is helpful. So and for the interest of time, I'm going to start my vegetables first. I'm just going to turn my heat in. I've got a real mild like canola oil in here. Uh, when you use a stronger flavored like extra virgin olive oil, that's perfectly fine, but understand that will flavor your soup. So anything that you put in there has a flavor, affects the flavor of your food, right? So I've got oil in here warming up. And then I have my vegetables and I just did a medium dice on my vegetables and they don't have to be perfectly uniform, but I'm a chef, so they have to be perfectly uniform for me. <laughs> but so I've got these chopped up. This combination of carrot, celery, and onion is called mirepoix veg. And the reason that matters is if you see that in an old cookbook, all it means is carrot, celery, and onion. So my oil's hot. Let's throw that in there. Chef, I have a question from Haley Rhodes. Great. What's the difference between stock and bone broth? Okay, so stock is an aromatic flavored water, basically, made out of bones. Broth is traditionally made with the protein, like the meat. And then a bone broth is a fortified and reduced stock, basically. So something that's cooked a lot longer, uh, more flavors are extracted. They might reduce it down so that the flavor is stronger and the, the nutrients that you've extracted are more concentrated. Good question. All right, so what I'm gonna do is I've salted my vegetables. And the reason that's important is it helps draw some of the moisture out uh, from the vegetables while it's sauteing. That helps reduce the risk of burning your vegetables while it's sauteing. And then it also helps, like, I don't like crunchy onions in my soup. That's a thing with me. So I like the salt in there because it helps to soften my, my onions too and my other vegetables, but especially my onions. So that's going to be working. And while that's working, I'm going to make noodles. So egg noodles are, to me, they have to be scratch made. Otherwise, it's just not like my great grandma or my grandma. It's just a thing. So I've got just a couple, couple, a couple cups of flour. And before someone asks, yes, you can do this in your mixer. And if you want to do this in your mixer, it's fine. Just be aware. I'm just going to do a generous pinch of salt. We always want to flavor our food as we go. So we have salt in here, a little salt in here. I'll throw a little pepper in. And the reason that's important is we're just layering the flavor and making the flavors better and better by layering it. So I've got my flour here and I'm gonna make a well in the middle. I like to do it by hand because if it's humid, really dry, the eggs might, you know, eggs come from chickens. They might vary a little bit in size. And when I do it by hand, I can kind of regulate how much flour and how much the eggs incorporate to make sure it's just the right consistency. I like my eggs to be room temperature because when they're room temperature, they whisk up easier and they incorporate faster. So I've made a well. And honestly, the hardest part about making egg noodles from scratch like this on a board is to not break the, uh, 
the flour dam. So let's see if I'm successful. So I'm just gonna take my fork and I just take a little bit of flour and I bring it in. This just takes a few minutes. I can even cheat a little bit and bring a little over this way. So I'm not breaking my dam, but I'm still putting more in. And you'll see that what happens is it'll be like, oh, thank you, Derek. It'll be like nothing, nothing, nothing. And all of a sudden you'll start to get a gooey mass and then a dough, which is pretty fun. Don't hurry this though, you'll break your dam. <laughs> and all, it doesn't really affect the quality of your noodles if you break the dam. It, all it does is uh, make a bigger mess. So bring it to the center. Choo, choo, choo. And you can see it to start to thicken. It's funny because if I, I've heard stories of other folks who have this in their home and they'll say that if they try to use um, the store-bought noodles, that their kids will like revolt and be like, what is this? <laughs> <laughs> telling stories about turkey noodles. Do we have any other questions while I finish this up? Coming through. Oh, that smells good. It's almost there, I promise. There it goes. See how it's starting to turn to like a gloopy mass? A little bit more flour and it'll turn into a dough. There it goes. If you do Chef, this, in the, we yeah. have a question not yeah. pertaining to your noodles, but yeah. what was your ice cream job? Oh, so I worked at a, um, a I worked at a, a college restaurant called the Keter Center in Point Lookout, Missouri. I worked there for four and a half years, and while I worked there, Point Lookout, like College of the Ozarks, is a private school in southern Missouri. And they, um, they have their own dairy farm. So they thought, hey, let's start our own ice cream shop. So they did a creamery. So my job was to run the creamery, make sure the ice cream was good, make sure the recipes were good. And then I also taught an ice cream class at that college. It was a lot of fun. And all of my, all the people who worked for me were students. That was pretty cool. And it was, yeah. So I learned a lot about ice cream. And it was literally my job to eat ice cream every day. It was awesome. So you. as you can see, once that starts to dough, turn into a dough, it turns into a dough very quickly once you have enough flour. And I've got all this flour. That's why I like to do it by hand because I can feel that it's a nice dough and I don't need all that flour, which is why I prefer to do it by hand so Jessica Jones wants to know, does it matter what type of flour you use? It does. So for an egg noodle like this, I prefer to do an all purpose flour, which most people have in their cupboards already. And the reason why is because a dough like this, unlike if you were making pasta for spaghetti or fettuccine or whatnot, it doesn't need as much gluten. And when you use a semolina flour, which is the traditional flour for making those types of pastas, um, it has much higher gluten content than your all-purpose flour. In fact, that's why it's called all-purpose flour is because it was specifically designed to have some gluten, but it'd be a little lighter, you know, <laughs> there's a whole history behind it. But I'm not gonna need this for the six to eight minutes it takes to knead this by hand because I have magic of TV, but you can see this comes together and I want it to be, when I'm done kneading it, I want it to be smooth, but it doesn't have to be as smooth as if you were making bread. Because once again, I want sort of a dumpling noodle. So I'm gonna set this aside over here, move my flour and magic of TV. I've had some rolled out here. And then I've got these here. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna let the noodles rest for about 30 minutes. And if you're cooking in your kitchen, you know, sauteing this or getting something else ready, then just let it rest on your counter. I did this dough yesterday and I pulled out of the cooler and let it rest for a little while. And it, it rolled out really easily. I like my noodles pretty thin, as you can see. And so what I'm gonna do now is cut them. And it's really easy, you just roll it up. 
Chef, how do you know if you have used too much flour? It will be really hard. Your dough will be like really tough. You, you can see my dough is nice and pliable. You can see I kind of stretch it. And if there's too much flour in there, then it will not stretch that easily. It'll be, it will just seize up on you. So what I always tell people is you can always need in more flour, but it's much harder to incorporate more moisture. So with that in mind, always err on the side of caution, make your dough a little wet. And then as you're kneading it, you can throw a little extra flour on it. If you see that it's sticking to your hands really badly. It's like salt. You can always add a little more salt, but you really can't take it away. So here are our noodles. See? Our little noodles. I like them nice and long, and they're going to puff up when we cook them. And then I like the extra flour because I like my soup to be kind of thickened by the flour. So that's why we toss it with lots of flour so it doesn't stick once you've cut them like that. And that's it. I'm going to put these over here. So my vegetables here. Are just right. I'm gonna take my gloves off here because they are fully covered in flour. <laughs> and then my vegetables are sauteed. My onions are translucent. They look wonderful. Thank you, Derek, for babysitting that for me. At this point, I'm gonna add my turkey. It's about four cups of turkey. It's about a pound. You can add more or less as you're liking. One thing people don't realize is that a good stock still will taste better if you add all these nice aromatic vegetables to it. So not only do these vegetables add a really nice component to eating it, because you see all the nice vegetables, you bite into a little carrot, little celery, a little onion, but it also adds more flavor to the entire bite of the soup. So once I add that, I'm gonna add my stock. And I'm gonna bring my stock to a simmer. We are not going to sit here for the 10 or 15 minutes it takes for this to come to a simmer. Instead, Derek's going to bring over a batch that's already hot. <laughs> Thank you, Derek. You want to put that right there? Great. You want to put that? Got it. So I'm going to just turn the heat up on this. There we go. And then bring this to a simmer. And it's almost there already because we kept it hot. Once this starts to simmer, we'll add the noodles. And then the noodles will go in here and they'll cook between five and seven minutes. And it really just depends on your, sorry, I was kissing my gloves. Really just depends on how thick your noodles are. These noodles, because they're fairly thin, will probably be done in about five minutes. Because they're fresh, you wanna make sure they're fully cooked, obviously, because they have raw egg in them. But if you're ever worried about that, if your soup is simmering, don't worry. It's going to be hot enough. It's not like so you have to. We have, your... we have some questions about um, when, when do you think you are going to start your weekly cooking show? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I haven't had an agent call me yet. So, you know, I love doing these. They're so much fun. And I will tell you, I, this is probably the first, not the last. So. And really, this is all about what you like. If you wanted a nice thick noodle, because you want it more like chicken and like southern chicken and dumplings, cut it thicker. That's fine. That's the beauty of cooking at home. You find what you like, you do it the way you want to do it. Because I will tell you, my grandmother did not put mirepoix vegetables in her turkey and noodles. It was basically, she would take the carcass and she would put it in the stock, then she would drain it, and then she would just pick all the little bits of meat off of the carcass, and then that would be the turkey. There wouldn't be a lot of turkey in it. And then it would be a lot of noodles. <laughs> and so I like mine, it's a little flashier, you know, but I like mine to be more of a complete soup. And I like mine with a lot more turkey. Okay. And, oh, I see movement, it's almost there. I'm just peeking at the clock. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in here. I'm going to finish cooking. While this finishes up and cooking, I'm going to turn it over to Derek so that we're timely because we have more stuff to show you at the end of our demos, which is really exciting. So I'm going to take these. And once this starts bubbling and it's really close, you can almost see it. 
There's some movement like right there, which means we're probably about a minute or two away. I'm gonna add these noodles in here and cook them up. But right now I'm gonna turn it over to Derek and he's gonna demo his tacos, which look fantastic. So Derek, take it away. Hi everyone. So um, I just thought we could do something really different. So let's say you're not doing a turkey dinner or this is from leftover Christmas. You have some leftover roast beef or um, I thought, let's turn it into tacos. So we're gonna do a, uh, um, just like a roast beef chipotle taco and then we're gonna make a, a um, any horseradish cream that you have left over with throwing a little avocado and some lime and do a little avocado crema to go along with that. So get started on that one. We're just gonna julienne a couple of onions and I'm going to pretty simply just put this together. And this is something that any kind of ingredients that you have in house, doesn't have to be onions, doesn't have to be, it can be whatever you want it to be. So for that one, just, I like a nice slice. It can be diced, it can be however you want it. This just is gonna work well for me. So I can use that for later. Um, another thing is we can start um, shredding up a little bit of your cabbage. Just for a nice lettuce on the taco. <clears throat> Get this nice little shred. Then get your bowls that are stuck together. <laughs> All right. So after we have this nice little bowl here, set that aside, we'll crush up some garlic. Derek. Yes. T. Hamery is asking, how do you cut up an onion um, and not make your eyes water. So there's lots of tricks to that. I have um, have done plenty of different tricks, and, and some people say refrigerate your onions. Some people say hold hold a glass of water in your mouth while while you're doing it. And a piece of bread works. There is a ton of different tricks. Um, I think having cold onions helps. Making sure your onions aren't if your onions are really strong. Doesn't matter what tricks you're gonna do, you're, you're gonna weep, you know? So it's a matter of just being, just using a nice fresh ingredient, something that isn't overly ripe. Um, yeah, that's, that's pretty much it. So here we are with a little bit of garlic. Um, but again, Put in what you want. You want to do tomatoes. You want to do um, whatever. It's whatever's in there for it's whatever's in the refrigerator. So I'm gonna go and get out a couple of limes. I like to have these guys, and I'm really big on. I do all my vegetable preps first. Um, this way, I can use the same cutting board because once I've cut my roast beef, it kind of becomes a roast beef cutting board. So. I just like to pre-do all my stuff. So there's a little bit of limes. And my family loves this because I cook like this at home and I have just tons of bowls and I don't have to do dishes, so that's even better. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think what we'll do is we'll do a roast beef. So this is just an extra uh, this is just a, a, a New York strip that we had roasted off. Um, and as you see, it's nothing really special with it. We just roasted it. This is what we have left over after our feast. So all I'm going to do is cut it whatever shape you see fit. For me, I'm just going to do some small cubes. So... Just 
just whatever shape you want. So we have that. We're going to go ahead and put our pan on the stove. And we're going to get our pan nice and hot. All right. So now that we're nice and hot, add a little bit of oil. Just enough to make it nice and shimmery. Derek, Sabrina yeah. is asking, can you use a beef brisket instead of roast beef? Absolutely. Uh, beef brisket, I mean, you're going to want it to be cooked because brisket is really tough meat. So most briskets are cooked braised and that's going to soften it up. That's going to make it nice and tender. For something like that, a nice good sliced brisket would be awesome in this recipe. A flank steak would be really good. Tenderloin would be really good. There's so many different options. It's whatever you have on house, you know. Um, I mean, this would be work really well. Let's say if you did pork belly, um, and you do, you could do the same recipe as pork belly, and it would be great. So, so we're just going to soften up our onions. Adding a little bit of salt, lots of, lots of seasonings throughout as you cook. And then just getting a little bit of color on them. Nothing, nothing crazy, just kind of bringing out a little bit of the, a little bit of the sugars and just softening them up. Because although for a soup, you might not want a crispy onion, a crispy onion would be kind of nice in something like this, because you're going to get that little bit of a crunch and that would be good. Um, but again, if you don't like it, don't put it in there. It's your choice. So here we have a little bit of cumin I'm going to put in. A little bit of uh, chipotles and adobo sauce that I've diced up. Hey, Chef Derek. Um, Lois is asking, chipotle is a little too smoky flavor for me. Uh -huh. Is there another sauce that can be added instead? Well, absolutely. See, chipotle is... is Essentially, it's jalapenos that have been smoked and cooked down in the sauce. So what you're going to want to do with that is um, use fresh jalapenos. You could use some serranos. You could use whatever pepper you really want. It, it's, your, it, it's your dish. So I'm using a little bit of our turkey sock that we had in house. You can use chicken sock. You can use better than bullion. And I'm just adding a little bit of water now because I have my seasoning. I have my chipotle in there. And I'm just going to give it a little stir and just kind of bring that to a little simmer. Just incorporate that flavor and let that beef suck that flavor in. So now we have this. Nice little flavor. It smells great. And then I'm just going to let that simmer. In the meantime, I'm going to start making my avocado crema. So just take a couple of avocados. And I'm looking for something pretty ripe. I want it to be nice and, nice and soft. And you just cut all the way down and around that pit. And what we do in the kitchen is give it a little twist, and that comes right out. And then we give it a quick little pop and that comes right out. Then there's many different ways that you can finish this off. I use a spoon and just kind of pull it out. Then I'm going to adjust my seasoning here, give it a quick taste, see how we're looking. It's always important to, to season and taste as you go. A little bit more salt. 
Ooh, a little bit more stock. Just going to let that go a little bit longer to get that flavor in there. Okay. So here, I'm just going to mash up my mash up my avocados using a fork. Use a mixer. Use whatever you have. Me, I kind of like the rustic, the rustic feel of this. So, plus when you get done with this, you're going to get a little bite of avocado in one of your things. It's going to really burst out. It'll be really nice. So then I'm going to take a little bit of my lime. So we're going to throw in a little bit of lime. We're going to add a little bit of cilantro. Yeah, I'm just going to give that a quick little chop up. Just nice and doesn't have to be too fine. Now, Derek, something I like to do with my tacos mm -hmm. is I like to mix a little bit of the whole cilantro leaves with like my lettuce or cabbage, yes. and it makes a really nice bite. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And mm -hmm. that's kind of what I like to do to garnish my tops with. Yeah. So I only use half of my So cilantro. good. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So then we're gonna take some leftover horseradish cream that you might have in the refrigerator. And we're just going to fold a little bit of that in. So this is just a kind of a cool way to, to reuse horseradish cream because what else are you going to use it for? It's kind of one of those weird oddball things that, you know, you can make a sandwich out of it. You could add it with mayo. You could, you know, and, and do, you know, have like an aioli or with a burger. But this is just another way of incorporating it, adding something different to it. And then we'll just check to see how that came out. A little bit of salt. And a little bit of pepper. And I'm going to go a little bit more lime because I really want that lime to come out and be nice and forward. So here's a little bit of lime. Give it another little taste test. I test lots. That's right. That's great. That's great. It's fantastic. So now I'm going to go ahead and check on our Checking our beef. Yeah, really good. We're ready for a, we're ready for this all to kind of come together and plate up. So for something like this, I like to take a couple of flour tortillas. And I warm them slightly, right on the, right on the burner. Doesn't have to be a lot, it's just enough. What it does is just kind of makes them a little bit more easier to work with. What if someone doesn't have gas at their home? So How would they do this it, at home on an electric oven? I have a glass top oven. Mm -hmm. So my glass top oven is perfect because I just turn my glass, I keep my glass top oven on really clean. And I just put this right on top of my glass top oven. If you have a, just a normal um, uh, coil, you can go ahead and just um, um, put a saute pan right on it. Do it that way. So here we go. We got a little bit of nice char on that taco. That'll come out with some nice good flavors in there. And throw on some, throw on some beef. If you want, you can even cook this down until it comes into more of a sauce if you'd like. I think my flavor is there, so I'm not too concerned with it. Then we're going to go a little bit of shredded cabbage. And take a little bit of that cilantro cream.
Then some cilantro on top just to kind of finish it off. And then you're sitting on kind of a cool little twist on something. Derek, Kurt yes. is asking, do you prefer flour or corn to tortillas? So it depends on what I'm doing. But uh, if I'm just eating as, as a taco, I'm a flour tortilla kind of guy. I kind of like the way they roll around and I can eat it. If I'm doing like a tostada, if I'm doing something where, where uh, you know, I want to be eating it with a knife and fork. I know I'm going to be getting messy. I'll go corn tortillas because I like that flavor of a corn tortilla. <laughs> Sometimes I'll make fresh corn tortillas because if you make them fresh, they, you can still fold them and use them as a taco. It's pretty good. So. I'm team corn tortilla, just the for the record. Team corn tortilla. <laughs> I, we use a lot of flour in our house just because of the ease of them, but I, I, I'm team corn tortilla. <laughs> Here, we're going to move Derek's dish to the center here so that you guys, so you all can see. There that. And then I've bowled up some of our finished turkey and noodle here. Yum. I garnished it with a little parsley just to make the, you know, chefs like their garnishes. <laughs> it makes the dish pop. Um, and then to finish the night out, uh, we have prepared other things because obviously we could probably go on for, I mean, literally two hours and, but we, we have an hour. So what we did is we prepared a bunch of other dishes and we're going to kind of touch on each one and talk about how we incorporated our holiday leftovers into each one. But first let's make a cocktail. So <laughs> what I did is uh, we infused candy canes, leftover candy canes into vodka. And it looks almost pink on the screen, but it's actually like, like it's like vibrant pink on the screen, at least we have here. But it really is kind of like a candy cane pink, which is really, really fun in real life. It is two parts regular vodka to one part vanilla vodka. And you can buy vanilla vodka or you can just take a vanilla bean and put it in some vodka and it'll start tasting like vanilla after a while. So, <laughs> and that's what we did is it's so... For this, it was a cup. I was trying to think of the exact measurements for y'all at home, but it's a cup of regular tequila, Tito's, or not tequila, vodka, vodka Tito's. And then we used uh, a half cup of the vanilla and then uh, five candy canes, five like six inch full size white and red candy canes. And it dissolved within a few hours. It was, we did, made this a few days ago. Then I've got Kahlua and half and half. So we're going to make, it's, we call it a candy cane white Russian. Um, I like to think of it almost like uh, a spiked uh, peppermint iced mocha, because that's kind of how it comes across on your palate, which, you know, yum. So I'm just gonna, it's, this is a shake and drink. So I'm just putting ice in my shaker. Uh, the rim of my glass, my highball glass here, has just, I took some corn syrup and some crushed up candy canes. And there we go, that looks about right. A little more ice, there we go. And I dipped the rim of the glass in the corn syrup and then in the candy canes to get that rim. You could also do this like in a Cosmo glass or something like that if you really wanted to get super fancy. I prefer this glass. So then we are gonna take this and we're just gonna measure it is one ounce of Kahlua, and this is a one ounce shot glass. So one ounce Kahlua. One and a half ounces of your candy cane vodka that you made at your house. The nice thing about this is you store it in a cool, dry place, and it is good for a very long time. And then one ounce, your half and half. Right in there. Now, traditional white Russians, obviously, the half and half is stirred in at the end, but... We're making it easy. So just shake that up. And then we're going to pour it in. Look at that. Just right. There we go. Chef Aaron is asking, what is your favorite holiday dish? My favorite holiday dish? Um, I am a total sucker for a traditional Thanksgiving dinner. 
Uh, in fact, at Christmas time, my family will eat pizza or I'll make, you know, Asian inspired dishes or whatever the kids ask me to make really. I'm like, sure, whatever. But Thanksgiving is like sacred in my house. So that's a roasted turkey. That's the uh, dressing, the green bean casserole, mashed potatoes. So that is, I, I don't know why, it's just very sacred to me. <laughs> and so that's my favorite. I, Thanksgiving, I look forward to the food the most for Thanksgiving of all the holidays ever. So, yeah. Do we have any other questions right now, Diane? Ask away, folks. Now's the time. Uh, we're going to start talking about, I'll move this forward. Start talking about some of these dishes that we have here. So this is a hash. You could do this with turkey too, but we've got potatoes in there, some leftover, you know, roast beef, uh, onions, and then you saute that up just like a traditional hash. I personally love making my hash with sweet potatoes instead of regular potatoes. I just think it adds a different dimension of flavor. And if you've got one or two sweet potatoes left over from your holiday that you did, ended up not cooking, it's great for it. And then I love to serve this with a fry, like a runny egg over the top, you know, over easy. And then it kind of, the, the yolk oozes into your hash and creates a sauce, which is really good. Then behind that we have, this is a- This is a sweet potato pancake. It's done up with a little bit of maple syrup and, and uh, toasted pecans on top. So pretty, pretty simple. We just mashed up our old on hand sweet potatoes and added a little bit of flour and some egg and a little bit of baking powder and just poked them off. And, and they come out like custard on the inside. Really wonderful. Yeah, so not really a traditional pancake, but a really nice different thing that you can do with your leftover sweet potatoes from, you know, and even if you have some marshmallows in there, it's fine. Just mix them in. It'll just yep. sweeten the pancake. <laughs> then here we've got meatballs with a cranberry barbecue sauce. So we took some leftover cranberry sauce and we incorporated it into a barbecue sauce recipe and then cooked up the meatballs and tossed it together. You know, we hear about cherry barbecue sauce, especially being in Michigan, yep. and we hear about other sweet barbecue sauces and people don't think about your good old cranberry sauce. It's a great way to use it up. And then this here is a frittata. You can make it into a quiche as well. Um, here at the Northern Center, we do try hard to uh, make things as universal as possible. So we do a lot of frittatas because they're naturally gluten-free. And I like to call this like the cheese board frittata because it's you look in your refrigerator and find all of your little leftovers. So this one has, I know it has ham. This one has ham and Swiss cheese inside of it. Okay. But say you've got like when we're back to entertaining and bringing more than one or two households together for the holidays um, and you do say a cheese board or a charcuterie board, you can go in there and you'll have your bits and pieces left. And that makes an awesome frittata because all those different flavors and cheeses ground up with the different meats and you just put it in your base frittata recipe and bake it up yep. yum and mm. then over here we have two different cottage pies so a cottage pie is like a pot pie with mashed potatoes instead of a crust this one's turkey this one's beef and what's really great about something like this is you can take your leftover protein and your leftover gravy that you have in your refrigerator and I mean, in my house, we don't have leftover gravy, but if your house has leftover gravy, then you take the gravy and your different vegetables. You can take, like say you did roasted vegetables with your roast, take some of those roasted vegetables, mix it with your gravy, uh, maybe add a little more stock to loosen it up a little, put it in your pan, put your leftover mashed potatoes on top, pop it in the oven, and you've reinvented, you've reinvented your roast or your turkey. And then here, Derek, why don't you tell us about this awesome soup? So we have, a but we have a butternut squash soup that we have, taking just old roasted butternut squash that we've had, uh, roasted it down with some onions, we made them nice and caramely. So this has a little bit of sweetness to it. And then we added a little bit of maple syrup to bring out that sweetness and a little bit of a um, uh, little bit of uh, veg stock just to kind of keep it nice and vegetarian, keep it gluten free. And then we just pureed it and then topped it with some nice spiced pumpkin seeds or, or pepitas. Pepitas, yeah. Pepitas. Derek, Katie is asking, what is your favorite holiday leftover? Well, favorite holiday leftover? I'm weird for holidays. I love to do, I love to do German food. So I love schnitzel and spetzel. Nice. And I just, 
and, and I can, I'll make my spetzel. Then I, spetzel is a German dumpling that you, you cook it in water, you remove it from the water, cool it down, and then you saute it in butter and, and really hard saute. So it's this really earthy and, and um, um, savory, just wonderfulness. And, um, and, and I can eat that the next day, sometimes cold. <laughs> um, but you can just keep reheating it. You can keep refrying it, a little more fresh seasoning. So I'm really big Spetzel fan. Love Spetzel. That's great. Um, great. Yeah. <laughs> Chef then Alden, Kurt is asking, have you ever deep fried a turkey? <laughs> no. So um, about deep fried turkeys, they're really cool unless you don't do it right. And there are so many ways you can go wrong with a deep fried turkey. It's one of the things that has gotten really popular and I actually recommend people don't do. Because <laughs> um, you have to make sure that the turkey is completely thawed out. It cannot have one speck of ice even in the inside because the turkey will literally blow up. You have to make sure that you're doing it outside which uh, beyond a grill, I generally don't recommend cooking outside unless you're camping. Um, but that's me personally. Uh, so yeah, I, I have not deep fried a turkey because I really like my limbs a lot. I like my fingers. I like the way my face looks. So no, <laughs> I've never done that. <laughs> yeah, I've never done it either. Um, I'm pretty traditional when it comes to turkey. Little seasoning, a little bit of a little bit of oil on the skin. Rub that in and just roast it very minimally. Yeah. I'm not a uh, our turkey that we cooked here cooked in about an hour and forty minutes. Mm -hmm. um, we I don't flip it. I don't take it out of the oven. I literally just season it really well, oil it, get it in the oven, get it back out. I'm a tried and true briner. I always brine my turkey mm -hmm. every year. Yep, because when I brine it overnight, um, if it if I get distracted or or whatever happens and it stays an extra half hour in the oven it's not the end of the world it's gonna, still going to be have tons of flavor and be nice and juicy and i find that when you reheat a turkey after it's been brined it retains a lot more of its moisture so i really like a brine turkey for me and i don't do anything fancy it's it's just like apple cider vinegar um brown sugar salt kosher salt not iodized salt and um and some peppercorns is all I put in my brine. So yeah. We, yes, Diane, do you have another? Yes. Um, Lynette is asking, will there be a Christmas edition seminar with more Christmas dishes? Um, we hadn't planned one. Do um, you want like Christmas specific dishes? That might be something we should look into for the future, but we don't have one planned currently now. Um, we do have one more dish to talk about. Derek, why don't you tell us about this cobbler or crisp that you made? So this is a nice apple crisp that we had made. So we had taken some, um, some apple pie filling that we had left over and we added it right to our, right to our uh, cast iron skillet here. And this could be, you know, maybe you just have some apple ciders or, or and, and we just sauteed a little bit of apples, apple cider and sugar and cooked it down a little bit till it got nice and thick and bubbly added it to here and we added a little oatmeal. This is an oat gluten-free um, oatmeal topping. And we just finished it in the oven. And this mm -hmm. is just a, a nice little way of, it's not really pie. You kind of get that feeling of, of something different out of it. You get a little bit of different flavors depending on what kind of spices you want to go with. So you don't get that typical, oh, I have a pie again or, mm -hmm. yeah. It's great with a scoop of ice cream on top. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Diane, so, do you have more questions for us? Not currently. You guys are doing a great job. Everything looks amazing. Great. Everyone is saying that they wish they could smell the kitchen right now. It smells really good. And one thing I didn't mention, and I was thinking about it, is if you notice, Derek and I taste our food a lot. And that's one thing that I think a lot of home cooks don't realize is how much we in a commercial kitchen taste our food um, and layer our flavors. We're seasoning for most things we season really at every step. I seasoned my mirepoix vegetable while I was sauteing it. 
I seasoned my noodles. I seasoned, and you didn't see me, I was off camera when I did that, but I seasoned my soup, you know, when, it, when the noodles had cooked and finished off. All of that is important because you do it in small increments like that, and then that way you can control the flavor really well. Um, chefs like to have control over their food and their kitchen and everything. So you'll see us tasting constantly. And I'll tell you, I do that at home too. I'll have a stack of spoons when I'm doing this type of dish and I will be constantly tasting. Um, and then throwing, you, okay, I'll be honest. I reuse the spoon when I'm at home, but I will, <laughs> if I'm cooking for guests, I don't reuse the spoon. <laughs> I do the two spoon method. So oh, I, the two spoon method, I do the yes. the two spoon method where. This is tried and true in the, in the kitchen right here. I will quite literally have one spoon that I'm tasting with and the other spoon will be the spoon that goes in my dishes. So it'll always be like that. No. Yeah, and you can reuse that spoon, but you can't reuse that spoon. No. <laughs> I can. Yeah, right? You can. But <laughs> that's now, my way of... I would like to go back to the noodles. Sure. sure. Um, how do you know when they're done? You drop them into the bubbling stock, and then how do you know they're done? So I pick one out and I eat it. Um, obviously I let it cool a little bit. You want it to have, it'll plump a little and you can see they kind of lighten in color. They'll be darker yellow when, before they're cooked, they lighten up. And then um, I want it to have just a little bit of bite. You're not gonna get that traditional al dente that you get with a pasta that you, um, like a spaghetti or a fettuccine pasta, but you should have a little chew to it and a little bite in the center. And that's how you know it's done. Um, the trick is you've got to make sure that your stock is really hot and truly simmering because with a fresh noodle like this, if you don't, um, and then you drop it in the stock, you risk it not being hot enough. And then the flour and egg starts to dissipate into your soup instead of cooking. That's why it's so important that it's hot because the outside will, the proteins from the egg will firm up really fast on the outside and then cook the inside slower. So, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So. Great. So does anybody else have any questions? Because we are nearing the hour. I can definitely say you guys do such an amazing job. And as I read all of the comments in chat. I think that everyone would like to see both of you again. <laughs> that's great. Yeah, that's awesome. Well, uh, I'm getting a message from Katie asking what my favorite food is. Yeah. Something very basic, the mashed potatoes. Oh, you can't beat a good Lots mashed potato. Butter, the mashed potatoes. Yeah. And I never mess with my mashed potatoes. You know, people will suggest, oh, throw some seasoning in there. Oh, the ranch dressing. I'm sorry, no. Do not put ranch dressing mix in my mashed potato. No, I want good old mashed potatoes with butter. And I usually make it with cream on the holidays. Yeah. And I always, I always use a ricer, potato rice. A ricer, yeah. I don't ever, so at home I've gotten away from mixer and it's kind of nice because now I don't have to peel my potatoes because as uh. I'm using a ricer, all my skins stay inside my ricer. Why don't you tell the folks at home what a ricer is in case they don't know what it is? So a potato ricer is quite literally, it's a, it, 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 it's, it's a cylinder. It kind of looks like, kind of looks like a little cylinder with a big long handle on it. And as you lift up, it has a little, it has a little, um, plunger, it has a little plunger on there and you can go ahead and it has this nice little netting in there, really tight netting. So, so what you can do is you can throw your potatoes and I cut my potatoes up a little bit but you can throw your potatoes in your plunger, in your, in your there cylinder. There you go. Hit the plunger on top of it, squeeze it down. It'll come through all these fine little holes. And as it comes through those fine little holes, you get this really, really fine texture as you're eating it. Yep. And then I heat my cream and my butter up into the side. Mm -hmm. So then all I do have to do is finish ricing my, ricing my uh, potatoes and it comes out like small little grains of rice. Yeah, that's so why it's called ricer. <laughs> so, right. It's so... Um, um, smooth that uh, I can just fold my cream and my butter in and I don't and then I just season season the taste a little it bit is, of salt yep. a little bit of pepper and that's it guaranteed um, lump free every yep, time <laughs> yep. super smooth um, I never use a mixer anymore I've been doing this probably now for a good 
four years. Of, so my, my mixer has been completely mashed potato free for quite a long time. There you go. Um, yeah. So. All right. Thank you both so much. Yeah. Um, you did a great job. Um, you have a lot of attendees um, saying thank you. Happy holidays to you both. Thank you. Thank Happy you. holidays to you all Happy too. Yeah. And everyone seemed to uh, really, really enjoy um, tonight's um, demonstrations. Let's see, we might have a couple more questions here. How about <laughs> some sour cream in the potatoes? Yes. Okay. Yeah. I'll take sour cream on potatoes sometimes. Sour yeah. cream does work. Uh, <laughs> it does create a different flavor. So when you're going to add something sour, you're going to get a sour flavor inside your potato, of course. especially as it warms up. So just be wary that, that the more you put it in the hot, that pot really comes out. It'll bring the flavor out for right. sure. I will say though, leftover mashed potatoes, a great way to kind of reinvigorate your leftover mashed potatoes is do loaded baked potato, Ooh, yeah. mashed potatoes, and you take sour cream, cheddar cheese, green onion and bacon and you fold that into you know warm up your mashed potatoes and you fold that in because you know sometimes when you warm up your mashed potatoes again they don't have quite the same texture because the starch has sucked up all the moisture and it can be kind of lumpy and grainy looking and if you fold those things in there and warm it back up it tastes phenomenal and it's so good and it kind of has that roasty flavor from rewarming up those mashed potatoes and so it tastes like it's supposed to taste instead of Rewarmed mashed potatoes. <laughs> so, <laughs> what type of potato is best for mashed potatoes? Oh, it depends on what you want to do with your mashed potatoes. <laughs> so at home, I always use red skins. Yep. But I like a nice uh, red red uh, red skin potato to me, nice and smooth potato. Um, so if you're gonna, yeah, go ahead. I'll say there's waxy potatoes and starchy potatoes. So if you want a pretty classic mashed potato, go with a starchy potato like a russet um waxy potatoes have tend to be creamier but you have to be careful because they can also be gummier like if you add too much moisture to them they're the ones that will be very glue texture like gluey but i love a skin on yukon or red skin mashed potato and i'll also tell you a secret I like to throw in a russet or two into my red skin or Yukon mashed potato because that starchiness helps keep it from getting that gluey texture. And so chefs have those secrets. You know, they'll say red skin mashed potatoes on the on the menu, but mm, there might be a few russets in there <laughs> just to make sure. Again, why on rice? Because if you're really mixing, you're going to build That's up true. that gumminess. That's gumminess. It breaks so, down those starches. So yeah. the less I handle it, that. and fiber right. all right so the, one of the last questions that we have are you going to post the recipes to the other dishes that you created we can yes. yeah i mean it's going to take us a couple days because i'll be honest we we totally chefed these because chefs throw things together all the time and that's totally what we did we're like yep. Wee, <laughs> let's a little of this a little of that but um we can yes. and we would be happy to do so yeah, Great. absolutely. I'm here. I'm reading. Yes, please. <laughs> That's <Okay>. great. <laughs> well, absolutely. We can do that. Well, great. So thank you so much, everyone. We're so happy you joined us. It's an absolute pleasure to do this for you. I hope you gleaned some ideas and got some inspiration. And most importantly, we here at Northern hope that this gives you a bright spot in this time when we're kind of all stuck at home and gives you something really fun to look forward to and participate in. And we're hoping to do it again in the future. So have a great night, everyone. Thank you so much. And um, thanks Chef Alden, Chef Derek and Diane for such an amazing evening. Um, I also need to give a special shout out for uh, to NMU's AV team for making us feel like we are right there in the kitchen with you. So thank you so much to them as well. Um, we couldn't do it without them. They are the behind the scenes heroes of all of this. So thank you. Um, quick reminder to join us on January 13th. You can go to our website to find out more information on that as well. Um, and then like the chefs mentioned, we will work on getting the rest of um, these recipes added to that drive. So the link that you have in your email and the one that I just put into chat, and I'll also send it in tomorrow's email, um, that will just keep 
updating those as we get them. So just keep that link handy and then, and then check back in a couple days. Um, a, quick, uh, a quick note as well, we'll also be choosing one winner from tonight's attendees to receive an alumni t-shirt. So keep an eye on your email. And in um, the email that I send tomorrow too, we're also gonna send out just a brief little survey. So let us know how you liked the event tonight and let us know um, if there are any topics for Northern Now that you would like to see too. So we're doing anything um, you know, from athletics, as you can see, to cooking, to um, artificial intelligence, which is next month. So we want to make sure that we give you the things that you want to see. So please let us know that as well. Um, if you have any follow-up questions or anything, to shoot them to us at um, alumni at nmu.edu. And we hope you have a great holiday. Thank you again for joining us. And we hope to see you again soon.